And previously, I've tended to talk an awful lot about the technology. So Chris did so much of that today, um, I, it sort of seemed like it would be good to do something slightly different. So um, bearing in mind I'm, I guess, about a year away from being in the industry for about 30 years, I thought it would be a good idea to go back and look at the history and look at what I've learned and have a bit of a, a joke and a laugh about some of the things that we see in the industry. So, with that said, there's no technical deep dive. I'm not going to go into anything in any, any, any depth. There's no incisive comment. <laughs> um, no corporate analysis. It's just a bit of fun. And I just thought it'd be good to do something different to what I normally do. So, there we go. So let's start with some truisms that we hear in the industry all the time. Everybody is expected to do more with less. Everybody's budgets are supposed to be shrinking, and you know, we're, we're expected to somehow to deliver to more and more stuff all the time. Well, let's face it, we've always done that. That's always been the case. I don't think anybody's ever had a budget that's gone up year and year and year in proportion to the amount of data they're storing or to the amount of work they're doing. We've always had to come up with new solutions. So in reality, that's just, you know, that's just what it is. This is another great one I hear all the time, and I think we're creating too much data, and I think, how can we create too much data? How can we create more data than we can actually physically store? Well, we obviously are, but what we do is we filter it, and we throw away a lot of the stuff that isn't really relevant. We might pre-filter it before we store it. So yes, we are creating a huge amount of data, uh, probably far too many pictures of cats and, and dogs and various other animals that go, end up in uh, big data centers and Facebook, but yeah, you know, there's an awful lot of data out there. Shared storage is dead. We don't need those stinking storage arrays anymore because we've got vSAN. And we've got all of those other products that allow us to just throw that stuff away. Well, yeah, okay, the business for certain companies like EMC is reducing, but um, Nick just said they partnered with Earth Pure Storage because they see them as a company who are up and coming, who are um, developing products that, are, that people want to buy. So I don't think shared storage is dead. Not quite yet. There's another one, Enrico. Storage administration is dead. This was one of yours, I think, from a blog post the other week. Well, yeah, no, yes and no. Um, in fact, um, I was talking to Simon, who's sitting down there, whose comp ex-company shall remain nameless, but um, he told me earlier today that his particular company has 300 storage administrators, <laughs> which is a serious number. They're not all administering storage, but there's a good chunk of them, I believe, are administering the storage. So storage administration isn't quite dead yet. We've got a while to go. And ah, well, yeah, okay, so in the future. And probably the most interesting one of all, which is a truism, that vendors have a solution to all of our problems. And I shouldn't, I should be, shouldn't be too unfair, should I, I guess, because there are lots of vendors in the room today, but, you know, vendors always come up and always have a solution to our problems. So... <clears throat> One of the things that we're, I don't know whether this graph comes out very well from, from a distance, but one of the things we always hear about is we're storing more and more data. The amount of data we're storing is going up. CPU doesn't keep up with it. I.O. access rates don't really work. So we're, 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 we're always having a problem with the ability of our storage to deliver. But do you know what? This was a chart from 1987. This isn't the current chart, and you can sort of gives it away, really, because they talk about MIPS and megabytes rather than gigabytes, terabytes, or anything else. But this is a... And it only goes the, to 1990. And it only goes to 1990, <laughs> which is a bit of a giveaway. So, you know, if, if, if you were actually looking carefully, you would, you know, you'd probably have realized... It's got that strange DASD term in there. And it's got DASD in there as well. So, actually, do you know what? I am, yeah, absolutely. So this is, this is a, a chart from when, the year I started work. And that is the same problem we've always had. And the, the problem's always been there with storage. So it's nothing new. So what are the real facts? What are the real facts we've got with storage? Well, first of all, prices continue to decline. Absolutely, definitely. And I presented um, charts before where we've looked at the decline in cost. And, you know, we're now down into the um, single dollars or less for a terabyte of storage, depending on what you're buying, whether you're buying flash or, you know, something a bit bigger like an object storage. And probably more useful in there is that... Storage hardware is becoming super reliable. I'm sure that our friend at the back there from um, HGST would want to say that. I mean, what, now we, we still talk around 2 million, 2.5 million hours MTBF for a drive. 
Um, but, you know, I, I very rarely have seen personal drive fail. I've seen drives fail in, in storage arrays, but, arrays, but, you know, that happens. But actually, storage hardware is super reliable compared to what it used to be like. Um, anybody who, and we'll see a picture of it in a little while, anybody who did anything with uh, mainframe storage from many years ago, you did, Martin, so you know, um, would know that in those days we had no RAID in those boxes, and every drive, when it failed, physically failed, we had to run something to go and extract the data off individual tracks on the disk manually, and it was a pain in the ass. But it's, it's what you had to do, because the, the, weren't, the, the, tech, the technology wasn't that reliable. Um, next one we've sort of already touched on, really. Data volumes are increasing, but yeah. But a lot of that is transient, because we're throwing a lot of that away. Um, and probably more importantly, in, in terms of that one, is we have no way of measuring the value of data. And obviously, for people who are building object stores and so on, they, they're very happy with that because we don't throw it away. Um, and we don't throw it away because a lot of the time we have no idea whether we still want to, want to use it or keep it. And actually, as Simon was saying, actually, there was another bit to what you were saying, Simon. I think we do want to throw some data away, and we should proactively be throwing data away because sometimes we want to prove we've deleted it. There are legal reasons why we'd want to prove and we've deleted it. Plant, exactly, yeah. And you, you, you've got it. And if, if you've got it, yeah, you, you could be in trouble. So actually, um, this, this one, I think, is one of our real problems, the fact that we don't really have a way of measuring what we think the value of our data is. Um, and I think that's a, that's a problem, you know, that we have to address. And how do we address it? Perhaps because our future in storage should be about <clears throat> managing the data and that, the actual content and not about managing the hardware. Because the hardware can do it now. You know, there are boxes from vendors that can that just work. You know, we don't have to worry about that. We should be looking at the data. And, and you made some great points, Rick, about protecting that data, protecting that backup data, making sure it's all secure and so on. And that's, that's I think, the more interesting piece is that we have to look after the data and not the hardware. We shouldn't really care about the hardware. Having said that, let's talk about the hardware. And this is quite interesting because I, I had no idea what Chris was going to present this morning. So... Um, so I dragged some slides up, and I think Martin will know exactly what this one is. The original IBM mass storage system. The f yeah, the little cartridges. This is the first automated tape library. And actually, it's probably not obvious, but each one of those things in the honeycomb is a cartridge, which has got a tape in it, and you actually pull the spool out, and it unwinds, and it, and it had some, I think, a pretty horrible sort of mechanical thing going out, extracting the cartridge out. But that was your early tape drive, automated tape library. In, actual, in an actual fact, I'm really surprised, Chris, that that wasn't on your list, because, you know, you'd think that would have been the technology that would have survived, but it didn't. It got replaced. And sadly, it got replaced by things like this. And thankfully, I didn't actually have to do any of the, the sort of the grunt work, putting the tapes onto, um, onto reels and, and mounting them. But in reality, that was really manual and painful work. And anybody who ever did anything with that would know about the leader and having to recut the, the tape and all the stuff that goes with it. So... Tape is definitely not dead, Rick. It just thankfully doesn't look like that anymore. Yeah. Um, this is probably one of my favourite pictures, just simply because there are, so many, there are so many pictures that IBM have got from the 1960s, 70s and 80s where they had to put a person in front of the device so you could get an idea of the perspective as to how big the, the actual device was. Um, and in actual fact, um, I did something years ago um, talking about one of these devices, which, you know, 1.26 gigabytes, ridiculous amount of storage. Um, and I, I tried to approximate how big I thought that device was um, to try and work out the density of storage as it is today compared to what it is now. So, sorry, then. Um, so I guess that was, what, five foot seven, maybe? Um, but one of the guys from IBM went down to their, their, um, their museum, um, a chap who works in Austin, I think, or Houston, he went down into their museum where they've got all of this stuff, and he got a tape measure out, and he measured it all for me. And he came back and said, it's this size by this size by this size, which was really nice of him. But, you know, huge, huge storage for really almost no space. Chris, you were talking about the density of platters. Look how thick those platters are on that disc. And we'll, we'll come on to another one in a minute, um, which actually I'll, I'll do now, I think, which gives you a bit more of an idea, and that's how disk drives have shrunk over time. And this picture's on Wikipedia, so you can go and grab it out if you like. And the ruler there is measuring in inches. So you've got one inch, 1.8, 2.5, 3.5, 5.25, and eight inch drives. And you think, 
how much that's changed over the years and miniaturized is just absolutely incredible. And when, and when we look at the, the ability to get more data on the disk, and you talked about aerial density, Chris, <coughs> this is how we managed to achieve it. If you look at the size of the head reading on the disk there, it's absolutely enormous compared to the modern head, which is, I guess, right at the end there, the tiny little bit at the end. So it's not surprising we've improved the quality of, uh, of disk drives and we've, we've been able to get more aerial density on because we've, we've come up with really, really interesting changes to things like the head design. Um, <clears throat> I took a couple of things out um, from, from history I thought would be interesting. And I don't, think, I don't know anybody who's ever seen this. I must be one of the only people in the, in the, in the world that actually had this device installed somewhere. And that's an Amdahl storage array called Elvis. It's actually called LVS, but it was called Elvis. <laughs> and I, th I don't know, has anybody else ever seen one of those? No? I think I honestly, have you seen one, Chris? I actually worked with it. Did you? Oh, OK. <laughs> there you go. So that might be the only reason why you know. No, but I don't. So, so we had one of those at British Gas, and I can't even remember what capacity or anything it had or what we did with it. But um, yeah, I thought it was a really fascinating name. And this one, I think is superb. Um, uh, a superb example of an older storage array. I don't know if anybody know what, knows what that is. That no, nope, not far off. It's a shark. I was going to say it's a shark. It's, it's a shark. And I just love the fact that there's a cardboard box yeah. sitting inside the array with, the, with all the manuals and stuff left inside it. Yeah, we still have that. We still have them. No, don't, not, not sharks, but if you go in back half the back of our storage racks, you pull them out, there's boxes of Boxes of stuff in. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Good old, old storage. Um, and then this one, this is, this is fantastic. It took me a while to find this, because I was trying to find, I, I used flash in the, in the 1980s, and it took me a while to find this flash device. So that entire box stores between 32 and 512 megabytes of flash. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's, there's no picture, there's no, there's no lady or man in that one, but I can tell you that's the same size as um, all the others. And you just look at it and think it's unbelievable. You know, no point, no, but actually, Latency-wise, it was pretty good. 0.3 milliseconds, that wasn't bad. Um, but um, it did only three megabytes a second, which is pretty, pretty <laughs> pathetic. So, um, so what is it? And unfortunately, my little graphic hasn't quite worked out here. There you go. Um, so what, what does it actually lead us to be able to say? Well, first of all, storage is definitely a commodity, absolute commodity, especially the media within storage. The amount of data we're storing now, we've got too much to micromanage all of that data like we used to. You know, we can't sit there and recover tracks of data or worry about individual files. It's all about putting policies in place. <coughs> and Nick, obviously, where you've gone, I can't see you now. Um, that's obviously one of the, you know, the, the features of your product, the fact that you're, lo you're looking to deal with this sort of stuff through policy rather than through understanding individual files. I actually think this is really important. Storage is cheap, so do you care? You don't really have to go back and look at it and try and pull out every single byte and recover it. You might as well just, you know, you waste a little bit, who cares? And um, as Chris mentioned this morning, you know, uh, densities are going to continue to increase. Um, and that's just going to be a fact of life. So, so technology seems to be in a good place. We're heading in the right direction. But what about the people? Let's talk about users. So... Theoretically, these people are meant to be our customers, and we should be really nice to them. And they're the reason why we're even there and have a job. But in actual fact, they just get in the way. They're a real pain in the backside. You know, they're always coming asking for more storage. They're, always, they're never happy about the performance. There's always something that they're not happy about. Um, and if we look at it, we can actually divide them into different types. So we've got the hoarder. The person who never wants to give their storage back, or always wants to keep hold of it, even when you're moving to another server or you're doing something different, they never want to give it up. <coughs> the perfectionist, the person who has to have the LUN numbers in order and doesn't like it if it's not named absolutely correctly with the capital letters or the small letters, whatever it happens to be, that they decide is their standard for doing it. The panicker, the person who comes to you at five o'clock on a Friday and says, ah, I need some more storage, I need, and I need it in 20 minutes' time. How many times have you had that person come up to you and say, I need it, and I need it, and I need it now, and this, you'll have to do the change control and all the stuff that goes with it. And then there's the daydreamer, the person who doesn't listen to you when you tell them how to configure their storage. The person who 
doesn't bother reading the manual and always comes back to you and says, oh, I'm not really sure how to do this. You know, what should I do? How should I do it? So, bosses. What about bosses? So, perception should be these are, are, um, are, they, these are the people that are in charge and they're more in tune to our customers than we are. They spend all their time strategizing and making sure that everything's heading in the right direction. In actual fact, they just get in the way. They always demand stuff at short notice. notice. They always moan when you want to go and buy more storage. And um, <clears throat> they um, potentially will go off and buy stuff from the, the company you didn't want them to buy from. So what type of bosses are there? And Simon asked me, <laughs> I saw, saw this slide earlier, and was asked me to tell him what, what type of boss he was. And I, I'm not going to give you that answer. I'll let you guess. Um, the tyrant. The person who wants it all, all done and wants it done straight away. Who comes in and moans all the time. Is never happy when you manage it, whatever you do. So what type, actually, you can tell us what type of boss you are, Martin, because you manage your storage team. That would be interesting. I haven't finished yet. You'll have to tell me when you're finished. Then there's the corporate guy. Always follows the corporate, corporate line. Buy stuff you don't necessarily want because somebody higher up the tree said this is what we're buying. The walkover. The boss you can just convince to do anything and who won't actually take any notes of you. And probably my favorite, because I had a lot of these, not you, Simon, but I had a lot of these, the micromanager, the guy who comes up and thinks he can tell you how to do it and hasn't done anything to do with provisioning or anything like that for the last 10, 20 years, or even actually in one case had never done it and still wanted to tell me how I should do the job. There's another page, isn't there? No, there's not another page. You can, you can add your own, you know, feel free to add your own. So now we get a bit more personal. What about colleagues? Well, there's no I in team. We're all there with working hard together. That's what we're about. But in reality, nobody does that job as well as I do. Everybody else is, is rubbish, doesn't adhere to, adhere to standards, don't clean up after them, don't do the documentation properly. So what are our colleagues then? How would we categorize our colleagues? Well, you've got the idler, the guy who actually doesn't do anything and manages to somehow get out of doing all the work. You've got the loner, the guy who doesn't really sort of join in and do what you do. He likes to just go off and do his own stuff, which brings me to the tinkerer, which is probably, I was probably this guy, I think. I was always the one going off and doing other things. And I remember one of my bosses actually, um, I asked him once if I could work on a project. And this is um, Graham. And he said, um, he said, why are you asking me? He said, you always just do what you want anyway, so just go off and do it. <laughs> and then, of course, the stickler. The guy who wants every single line in that spreadsheet, that Excel spreadsheet of your storage, in the correct colour, in the in the correct and case, spelled correctly. Spelled correctly. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know what? Oh, it's the sticker. Oh, there you go. How interesting. Isn't that good old good old error correction. You're not the perfectionist. <laughs> so, Chris, you're not the only one who's got a problem with spell checking. <laughs> what about vendors? <laughs> <laughs> well, perception, uh, as if you look at it in terms of perception, the vendor's all focused on the customer. He's focused on giving you that best deal, making sure you're happy. Well, actually, in reality, they're there to sell products. They've got stuff they want to sell to you, and they'll still try and sell it, whether you want it or not. You know, we've all got stuff that sits on the shelf that we don't want. I can't remember who mentioned earlier on this morning that um, there was... Um, was who mentioned 150k's worth of Azure licenses being added Azure. in? For, uh, that was um, P, uh, P, uh, first guy. Yeah, so added into it, which you didn't want, you know. I didn't want that. How many bits of software have you ever had from EMC that sat on the shelf that you never wanted? All of them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So what type of vendors do we have? Well, how about the backstabber? The guy who goes above you and above your manager and above his manager to make sure he gets the deal. Because he, he doesn't want you, he, he knows that you don't want it, but he wants to sell it to you. How about the miser? The guy's got the, um, the corporate budget and he's got an expenses budget, but he spends the money like it's his own money. I once had an EMC guy who told me I wasn't allowed to buy champagne when we went out for drinks. Um, so I, I got around the, uh, the problem by buying red wine that was more expensive than the, sh than the champagne. Uh, he wasn't very happy about it, but then again, it wasn't champagne. 
Um, and then, of course, then there's, then there's the mate, the guy who always wants to be your friend, who comes and sits with you and uh, chats with you. But actually what he's doing is just trying to get more information out of you to work out what he can sell. <clears throat> so how do, we, um, how do we deal with this then? How do we, how should we, what should we learn out of uh, you know, the last, few, last 30 years about coping strategies and how we should get through this? Well, first of all, I always used to keep a little bit of storage for emergencies and never tell anybody. <laughs> because when, I, when something went wrong and somebody panicked and we needed something, I had something I could give. And I could, I could always be the hero because I fixed the problem. <laughs> so there'd always be something that was slightly off the books that I'd never mentioned to anybody. And that worked really well. Well, another thing I think you should do is be a little paranoid. You know, what you never want to do is lose somebody's data. The cardinal was saying, I think, as, um, uh, <clears throat> as our friend Howard Marks would say, the, Howard, the, sorry, the, um, the cardinal sin is losing data. So be a little bit paranoid. You know, you just want to make sure that you're 100% happy the systems really do work the way you think they, they should work. Never volunteer for the risky jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not if you're wearing a red top. <laughs> and um, when I say risky jobs, one of the jobs I definitely avoided at all costs was decommissioning, taking stuff away from somebody. <laughs> because that was the one thing I knew, if you did that wrong, that was the one thing that was probably likely to get you sacked. So you'd always leave that for somebody else to do. <laughs> so putting that all together, what have we learned? Well, we'll never have enough storage. There'll always be de more demand than we ever, ever can cope with. Um, I always like to document things separately, because I tell you what, when you actually think, what was assigned to that server, what was mapped to it, and you rely on the box to tell you, and somebody's changed it, how do you know what it was meant to be like? You don't unless you've, um, you've documented it separately. And getting back to the very first point, be prepared to be a data manager, because I honestly think we're going to move away from worrying about the hardware to worrying about the data. And when we look at things like the cloud, when we look at things like hyper-converged solutions, there's less and less within those about understanding the actual hardware, and it's more about the data. And um, I raised the point with Chris earlier on um, this morning just to say, um, I think one of the things we're really going to see as an issue there is data mobility and the ability to move stuff around and actually make sure we've got the data in the right place at the right time. And that's, I think, going to be much more important than the actual hardware itself. And with that... That is my last slide, and thank you very much. <laughs> um, I should ask if you've got any questions, but then again, I didn't really have anything that you could question me about. But if you, if, if you have, please feel free.